So we've got a lot to cover, but I'm going to start with a little uh, background about the internet and the payment riddle, something about money, which is at the core really of all classes on finance, but we usually take for granted. And then Satoshi Nakamoto's innovation. Who was Satoshi Nakamoto? What is that innovation? A bit about crypto markets, the blockchain technology use cases. And then the core really is how to think about viability of those use cases. A little touch on central bank digital currencies and ground truth. So a lot to cover. If we don't get through it all, we will talk about this again when we talk about payments in class six. Um, in terms of some of the readings, I uh, shared with you two write-ups that were done for a class that Neha Narula and I teach an online class called Cryptocurrency, which is available through MIT. And those two write-ups, the economics of money and technology, um, I'm sorry, and the responses of big finance sort of give you some of, of the challenges and how to think through these technologies. Um, also, the Bank of International Settlement did a review just earlier in 2020 uh, about the central bank digital currency space because so much is going on there. And particularly after Facebook announced their Libra project in June of 2019, many central banks took note and said, wait, maybe there's something going on here that we too need to do more. Now, before Facebook Libra, there were many projects the bank, uh, the, one of the world's largest central banks, the Riksbank in Sweden was already looking at an e-krona project. There were other projects, but all of a sudden that Facebook Libra project kicked into high gear central bankers around the globe and particularly China's look and review and announcements around a digital currency electronic payments project also got kicked into gear. So regardless of where you come out, whether blockchain technology, cryptocurrencies are getting rolled into the stack, rolled into the technology stack of big finance. What we can say as of 2020, what's really the case is that cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology have at least been a catalyst for change, an important catalyst for change, pushing upon big finance, pushing upon central banks to reconsider how they do payments, how they do the basics of money. And I laid out a few questions. Again, Romain, we'll look for some uh, hands. We're going to keep this a little shorter than we usually do just because we have so much to cover. But how does Bitcoin fit into the history of money? What are the strategic and tactical considerations assessing viability and value propositions? And how are these central banks thinking about what they're doing? And Romain, if we can just see if we could get one or two people on kind of each of these three questions. Um, and these are the central questions I'm going to try to cover in the next hour or so. Okay, sounds good. Who would like to get us started? I'm watching for your blue hands. Quiet day today. If you wish, Gary, I'm also happy to cold call. All right. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to start. I'm going to kind of just go and then, but I, I hope that everyone would come in. I start with this scene, and, and, and I don't know if anybody wants to raise a blue hand and can tell me what movie this is from and, and the era. But this is the opening scene of a movie from uh, the mid-1990s, The Net, 1995, Sandra Bullock. Now, I start with this because Pizza Net was actually real. Now, the, 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 this cyber security sort of spy thriller with Sandra Bullock sort of cracking through the computer network. Remember, let's place this, mid-1990s. It was only the early 1990s that Tim Berners-Lee, associated with MIT, actually came up with the protocols that connects the World Wide Web. The internet had been around for some time, coming out of DARPA and the Department of Defense in the US and academic institutions, but by the early 90s, there was actually something that those of us in the public could use beyond universities, beyond the defense establishment and the like. But what hadn't been solved, what hadn't been solved by 1995 was how to move money on the internet. 
And Pizza Hut founded something called Pizza Net, which is thought to be the first commercial use where you could actually order something online just 25 years ago, order something online through Pizza Net. There was only sort of one problem. You ordered the pizza, and guess what? You couldn't pay online. Nobody had figured out how to pay online. You had to have the pizza delivery at your door, and you pay. So just think, it's in the middle of the corona lockdown. We're sheltering at home. And if it weren't for these inventions of 25 years ago we're about to discuss, you would be paying for that pizza at the door when the delivery truck arrived, or for your groceries, or for any other household goods that you have. So this riddle, what I call the payments riddle, what others call the payments riddle, uh, was at the core of this new technology, the internet. Now, the internet has been fully adopted into the technology stack of finance by now, but in the mid-1990s, it was, in essence, fintech. But the question is how to move value on the internet, to do it securely, efficiently, and really importantly, similar to the packets of data that move on the internet, as packets of data and thus peer-to-peer. -peer. See, the internet doesn't really have a central controller. All the data that we're live streaming right now between and amongst us, between 78 participants on this Zoom meeting right now, is through packets of data and it's not through one central controller, even though we think, well, Zoom might be controlling all this. But the challenge really was, how could you prohibit double spending? How could you send a packet of data to one person and ensure that that packet of data wasn't also sent to another, in essence, double spending? Having some data, like an email that we might send to two people, they're both reading the same email, they don't know that each are reading the same email. So that was this payments riddle, secure, efficient packets of data, but avoiding double spending. Lots of challenges, lots of attempts, and there were dozens of attempts, some that even went to go on to get patents and started businesses, raised money. Some of them through the earlier days of venture capital were back, like CyberCash and DigiCash and eGold, B-Money, all of these failed. All of them, dozens more beyond what I list here in the 1990s, and the hurdles were, well, of course, the same hurdles that any startup would have around merchant adoption. Would the, would the, the uh, stores actually adopt it? But this issue of double spending, and the only sort of solution to double spending was using centralization. That There was one central computer, one central controller to avoid the double spending. Or the other side of it, how did you form consensus if you didn't have a central controller had to form consensus on the state of who had the money and who didn't have the money. So this sort of central payments riddle, a big issue in the 1990s, attracted the interest of a cryptog cryptography group called the cypherpunk community. I kid you not, it's called cypherpunk community. It was an email list that had started in the late 1980s and had gone on for some time. And so, um, there were early digital solutions that were a little bit different. And some of the cryptography that was brought to it was not brought from the cypherpunk community. It was brought to bear from great cryptographers, some of them at MIT, some elsewhere, that came together by 1996 with a solution. It's this updated today, the same solution we use now, secure socket layer and transport layer security. These two protocols, on top of Tim Berners-Lee protocols about the World Wide Web from four or five years earlier, these are the main protocols. There are many others that were added, but these are the main protocols that allowed us to secure the internet. It's how we do it right now, a, a, a transfer of data that's secure by the use of cryptography. And what did that lead to? That led to a lot of things where we could accept visas and MasterCard American Express by the mid 1990s. Amazon, eBay were both formed in 1995. 
it's a founder's uh, dream to get formed right when a technology is transitioning. If Amazon, if Jeff Bezos had been formed in 1992, would it still have been around by 1996 when the secure socket layer and the cryptography was there for him to get going? If Jeff Bezos had decided to form it in 1998 or 99, it might have been too late. Now, there's a lot of things that Amazon got right and Bezos got right, but I'm saying timing was one that was remarkable. PayPal came along in 1998. And interestingly, the first mobile payments was actually uh, Ericsson teaming up with Telenor in 1999. Now that product is not around today, or maybe somebody will correct me and say there's still a little bit. But one of the early ones that really took off was Alipay, and then M-Pesa in Kenya. Now all of this still left the payments riddle. That payments riddle was still there to some in that cypherpunk community. Now the internet could get commercialized, the internet could move on. We had this way to, through cryptography to, to secure payments, but there was still this question. And it goes to the heart of what is money. And so I'm gonna turn a little bit to chat about money, but just see if Romaine has any questions so far. Nobody at the moment. Okay, so I like to go back in time. I like to go back 23, 2400 years in talking about money. It's not the first time money was discussed because money was really an invention of humankind thousands of years before that. But I like to go back to Plato and Aristotle. Plato did not write extensively on money, but what he did write is interesting is that money is a symbol devised for the purpose of exchanges. To think, you and I are gonna exchange something at the time. Maybe it was a goat for wheat. Maybe I needed the goat today, you needed the wheat tomorrow. But we can, we can use this symbol, as Plato wrote, as a purpose of that exchange. And interestingly, separately, Plato wrote, Plato wasn't in for using gold and silver for money. Now, this is interesting in contrast to Plato's student, Aristotle. Now, Aristotle wrote extensively about money. It seemed like Aristotle wrote extensively about many things, but one of them was money. And Aristotle wrote that it solves the problem of commensurability. The same sort of issue that Plato was grappling with, commensurability. You need rice, you need grains, I need goats. How do we have some commensurability between that? Or or the second point here, money is a guarantee that we have what we want in the future. So this is sort of a time commensurability. I need something today, you need something tomorrow. So these two forms of marrying up needs and wants and values, Aristotle talked also as a, as a, a philosopher about what is values, and then talked about four absolute values. Now, I hate to disagree with Aristotle, but you know over time, over time there are many of Aristotle's great writings that have been challenged about the earth and about the solar system, about the heavens, the skies, the bodies. So why not say that maybe Aristotle didn't quite have it right about money? Talked about durability, portability, divisibility. I still sort of agree, and most monetary economists would agree on that. It's this fourth point, did it have intrinsic value? I find myself more associated with Plato that said it was just a symbol. It's, it's but a symbol. And so today, when we think about money, we often think of six key characteristics. Is it durable, portable, divisible? These were, Aristotle seemed to, 2,300 years later, people still tend to agree, but rather than intrinsic value, that it's uniform, acceptable, and stable. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the economics of cryptocurrencies, but remember, instead of intrinsic value that it's uniform, that it's the same unit of account within some local or, or national economy, that others accept it, because if others don't accept it, how can I know that that's what I take today, I can use tomorrow? and then its value is stable. And we think over the last 300 plus years about institutions that help ensure that a currency value is stable. We call them central banks. 
So instead of an intrinsic value that we humans create some form of acceptability, uniformity, and stability. Questions? None so far, but I'll give our students a few seconds to raise their hand if they want to. Yes, we have a question from Hassan. Please, Hassan. Hello, Professor. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, my question is, uh, when you said that people could exchange things for other things, um, as a mean of, as a mean, so, I mean, how, how, could, how could the cryptocurrency survive if there is no intrinsic value in it? And it's, it's so volatile. And when you said that central banks make sure that these currencies um, are stable, it's because, like for instance, in my country, the, the, the central bank has to have gold and other currencies to uh, support the, uh, our currency, our local currency our uh, local currency. So I'm just baffled to, to, to see like someone speaks about, well, you know what, it's, it's, it's only a symbol. Okay, I, I know that it is a symbol, but it has to have some value in it. Otherwise, the other party would not accept it as, as, as a mean of exchange, if that makes sense. So, so Hassan is, is associating himself more with Aristotle than Plato, and I find myself more associated with Plato than Aristotle. So this is a worthy debate that's gone on for well, well over a couple thousand years. But when, when I say that it doesn't have intrinsic value and it's more about uniformity, acceptability, and stability, think about, uh, I'll take the US dollar. Uh, I don't know, uh, what's your country? Uh, I'm from Bahrain. So I'm not as familiar with your central bank, but let's take the US dollar instead of Bahrain. If you walk into the Federal Reserve, the US Federal Reserve, and you have a $100 bill, you know, paper currency, $100, what will they give you? I mean, other than that, they would probably send you on your way and the security guard would say, we're, we're in this coronavirus period, nobody's allowed in the building. But what, what would they do if you showed up at the, you know, the New York Federal Reserve or the you know, Richmond Federal Reserve and you said, I, I want I want something for this hundred dollars. I suppose that a few uh, years ago, that they would give me like a uh, gold, if that makes sense. Okay, so we got rid of that in 1933. Yeah. So a few years ago would be like at the beginning of the Great Depression under President Roosevelt. What would they give you in 2020? They would give me, I think, uh, the government's. Uh, that the government basically uh, would support this piece of paper, I assume. So, so you're getting at the government would sort of ensure through its means and methods that it's acceptable by other citizens and it's yeah. acceptable by the government. How do they do that? They say, well, we'll take it for US taxes. We'll take it for Bahrainian taxes. And in most economies, the governments are anywhere from a quarter to a half of the economy in some way. So they will accept it for a government. Yes. They'll yes. ensure that other people accept it through what's called legal tender laws, through the coercive power of the state. They will say others might must accept it. And this is not a new thing. G Genghis Khan was doing this in China uh, and it was pretty coercive. It was kind of you know, the coercive power of the state, you must accept the official currency. So acceptability can be accepted by the government. It can be acceptability that others must accept it for all debts, public and private. And they can work on stability and form central banks to ensure that, now what does it mean by stability? It means addressing the official sector to the supply and pricing of money. Supply and pricing the supply, we talk about the monetary supply, the pricing is through interest rates. But can you go into the US Central Bank, can you go into Bahrain and actually get gold? No, you can go in and get a $100 bill and they might give you 520s. If you really want, they'll give you 100 ones. But you yeah. still have just a physical piece of paper or a digital representation that I would contend, I'm sort of with Plato, it's just a symbol. It's a symbol that our society 
no matter whether it's small or big, has come together and it represents a store of value. It represents a means of exchange, but it frankly doesn't have intrinsic value the way Aristotle talked about it. It has only value because we humans place a value upon it. But uh, Hassan, are you on, still on the other side? You feel gold has intrinsic value. Yes, uh, I think because it's a uh, scarce metal and uh, I know that prices could go up and down, but still I could, I know that I could sell it one day and get money or get whatever. So gold, gold is but what we now call an element. It's, it's on the periodic table. It's, it's, it's got great attributes because it's scarce. It takes a lot of human resources to get it out of the ground. The other thing about gold, it's divisible, it's portable, it's uniform, it doesn't oxidize, so it's a really good base sort of element in that way as well. And now we have, give or take 10,000 years of acceptability, that it's a human shared narrative, some of it not good, some of it about war and slavery and all sorts of challenges in, in human history, but gold and to a lesser extent silver were very acceptable and stable. But yeah. think about this for a moment. All the world's gold that's ever been mined, if you take all of that gold, it can fit in four Olympic-sized pools. Four Olympic-sized pools, you can put all that gold into one space. Now, it's spread around the world in, in, in jewelry and in secure vaults, but it's only four Olympic-sized pools. I would kind of contend that's that's just a symbol. Uh, again, it has some, you know, kind of features that make it durable, and and it's got ten thousand years of human narrative um, and acceptability. And uh, I can assure you that uh, those who are really at, at times of trouble would probably take a piece of gold if it was really in times of war and and, and despair take a piece of gold over Bitcoin. But on the other hand, we're going to get into what Bitcoin is and how it creates some di digital scarce store value. So Hassan, we, we could keep going with a lively debate, but I hope that helps at least frame the sides of this thing. Yeah, I just have one thing uh, to, to say. Now, is, I mean, if, if the U.S. for some reason collapsed, what would happen to the whole monetary system? I mean, it's, it's very dangerous, if that makes sense. Because right. So you're asking what happens if a nation's currency collapses. And we have, we have history of that. We, we don't have recent history when a world's dominant currency collapses. But we've certainly in a history of many countries of currencies collapsing. In fact, right now, Venezuela's currency basically collapses. And what happens in countries that, where the currencies enter hyperinflation and start to collapse you start to see communities reach out to another symbol, some other symbol that is acceptable and has stability. It might be in the common time, in, in the current time, that those people will reach out to the US dollar. And your question is, what if the dollar collapses? But in, in, in monetary history, sir, so it usually that when a currency goes bad, people reach out to the better currency and it could be a neighboring country. It could be a different metal. Like when, when we had challenges between different base metals or even earlier times when we had uh, money that looked uh, a little different than we currently looked like. Um, let, let me hold that about what happens to the US dollar for a moment and just say the role of money because we'll, we'll lose time and I wanna get going as to what cryptocurrency and blockchain technology is. So the role of money, these three things, a medium of exchange as Plato and Aristotle talked about, a store of value that Aristotle basically said that I can hold it today for something tomorrow, that's a store of value. And it also then becomes a unit of account. The US dollar is a unit account in the US, the yen in Japan, the euro in, in Europe, a unit of account, these three roles of money. And it's looked very different over time, cowie shells are increased,
But today, I put here an Alipay mobile wallet. That's sort of what we use dominantly around the world. We talked a little bit about fiat currency when Hassan and I were going back and forth. A fiat currency is a representation of some central bank liability. Central banks, an invention of the late 17th century, both in England and in Sweden, just about the same decade in the late 17th century, was a check on the sovereign. You see the king, the king in England, using that story for a moment, the king was at yet another war with France and wanted to borrow money. Uh, and, and when the king wanted to borrow money going to the noble lords, the noble lords said, enough already, king, and said, we need some mechanism to control how much you can borrow and how much you can borrow is in essence a representation of money. And they set up the Bank of England. And in Sweden, it was a check also on the sovereign for a little bit different political reasons than a war with France. And there we had the initial sort of central banks. Here in the US, we went about it. Alexander Hamilton thought we should have something. That was during the um, 1790s. By the 1830s, Andrew Jackson said enough with this sort of centralized banking. And then we went for nearly 80 years, about 75 years from the 1830s to the 19 teens with no central bank. We had crisis after crisis and we formed one during President uh, Wilson's time. One of the great uh, sort of progressive uh, movements of the day and uh, just about a hundred years ago. But fiat currencies are representations of liabilities. And Hassan was saying, well, but don't they have something behind it? What they have behind it is the government's ability to, of course, tax, the government's ability to uh, be trusted, to keep its promises, to keep that currency stable. But again, just like when that, that English king was at war with France, sometimes, sometimes they overprint the money. Sometimes it gets out of control and central banks lose control. Um, but it has very big network effects that we talked about. The acceptance for taxes, for legal tender, it's accepted through what Mondale would say was an optimum currency area. Now we have 180 currencies around the globe and some work well and some don't work so well like Venezuela right now. And so in the midst of all of that, you know, the question is, and this is a little humorous, is what's money's future? Is it digital currencies? Or is it like in, in you know, kind of the fun movie Star Wars, is it uh, uh, these types of things, credit chips and the like? Now I would say if you're a Star Trek fan, in Star Trek, Gene Rottenberry didn't have any currency. If you go through all the original Star Treks and everything, they actually didn't have any money. That was Gene Rottenberry's future. Um, so he sort of dispensed with all this Plato and Aristotle. Uh, let's now let's sort of go a little bit more serious and then talk about Satoshi Nakamoto. But Romain, any questions? Um, None so far, let's give it a few seconds. No, I think we're good to go. So, so with that foundation, let's go back to the payments riddle. So we get through the 1990s, the internet is taking off, we figure out how to secure it, and the, and the credit card companies find a way to move money. Some startups happen, PayPal and the like, start up in this area, the FinTech of the late 1990s. Mobile payments start by the noughts, we already have Alipay and, and M-Pesa in, in Africa. But this payment riddle is still there. And that cypherpunk mailing list is still there. And on Halloween night in 2008, an eight page paper is written and is put up on the internet. On this cypherpunk mailing list, it might only be a couple hundred people. I've been working on a new electronic cash system peer-to-peer, -peer, no trusted third party, no central authority. And what Satoshi Nakamoto wrote in that eight-page paper 
what Nakamoto-san wrote was Bitcoin white paper had never used the word blockchain technology. We've come to call it blockchain technology. So what, what is the blockchain technology? Fundamentally, it's a, it's a shared accounting system, a shared accounting system or shared database system. So Satoshi Nakamoto had time stamped ledgers and a time stamped ledger with cryptography to secure it was not new. A time stamped ledger, my little uh, illustration here, uh, Neha Narula and I use this, so I wanna give her credit as well. Um, represents blocks of data. Blocks of data and, and between these blocks of data, a cryptographic hash function. A cryptographic hash function we use every day of our lives, just we don't know we're using it somewhere on the internet to commit to data. This, this technology, this, this idea of taking a block of data and adding another block of data and having a hash function in between was an innovation of the late 1980s. Uh, two Bell Lab scientists, Haber and Stonetta, wrote a paper about it, even started a company to notarize legal documents by 1995, a little startup called Surety. That existed. That existed. But what Nakamoto-san figured out was how to have multiple parties. Nakamoto-san solved the the consensus riddle, or what some people call Byzantine generals problem. The problem is, what if I don't know the other people keeping the ledger? Again, the Byzantine generals problem was not new. It wasn't even about money. The Byzantine generals problem had been written about in the early 1980s. It was a computer uh, systems problem. If you tie various computers together, what if one of them fails? Or even in an airplane, what if one of the engines fails? It's the question of fault tolerance. But what Satoshi Nakamoto did was solved it through something called proof of work. And we don't have the time to go through that, but what this, what this provided together was a decentralized auditable database. Now in the case of Bitcoin, 10,000 computers around the globe, maintain this auditable database. And this auditable database builds a block of data on top of a block of data on top of a block of data, but its shared accounting system uh, maintains it. There was one other thing that went on in this period of time. In the late 1990s, a computer a scientist, Nick Sabo, wrote a paper and coined the phrase smart contracts. Again, not an original idea, but what Nick Sabo said, what if we could take a set of promises, put them in digital form, and then the parties can perform against them? In essence, what if we automate in computer code the movement of a property right? Now, I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland. My dad had a vending machine business. You know, cigarette machines and candy machines and and, and, uh, uh, and the like. A vending machine is a smart contract. It's a conditional movement of property rights, the pack of gum, if you put some money in the machine. So you can think of a smart contract as digitizing basically a vending machine. They're not necessarily smart. They're not necessarily legal contracts, so I'd be cautious about that. But these two concepts came together, smart contracts, meaning can I digitize the movement of a property right? And then this accounting system of a shared ledger that multiple parties can share a ledger with no central controller. That, that's kind of the conceptual framework. Um, I wanna pause for a second, Romain, and <clears throat> take questions on what I usually cover <clears throat> what, what I usually cover in a lot more time than the few minutes that I just did. Any questions from the students? This must be because we just went through holiday time and um, <clears throat> we had our Zoom Easters and Zoom Seders. Um, there are no hands raised for now. Ah, we do have one question from Sally. Please. 
Okay, so I was just wondering, can you explain a little more um, the issues of the decentralized audit? Uh, audible database you mentioned very briefly um, when it had first come out and how these were solved but can you like I just to understand what issues they were solving can you kind of explain so what, what not if I understand the question what Nakamoto-san was trying to solve was what uh, has been come to call double spending can you can you in a digital way move a representation of value in a digital way, move that without having a central authority. We move digitally representation of values every day. When you go online and buy something, you go to Expedia, you go to Amazon, you go to Ali uh, Baba, we move digitally representation of values. We no longer have much of our economy on physical cash, but we, we always have some central authority, a bank, a payments company that we'll talk about in class six, uh, some central authority controlling that to ensure that you actually have that value, to authenticate and authorize the movement of that money. So what Satoshi Nakamoto was solving for is what if there was no central authority and it was a shared database or ledger or what I call a shared accounting system. That would be the core core thing, uh, this, this kind of riddle from the 1990s, we send packets of data around the internet with this out of central authority, um, maybe we do that. And I don't think it's a surprise this happened in the middle of the financial crisis, Halloween in the middle of the financial crisis, when, when trust in central authorities was quite low, and especially trust in Wall Street and banking and, and banks in Europe was quite low. Um, the, this burst of innovation came at that time. I, I hope that helps. And, and I think as we're going to chat through today and in other classes, the question is, are there other applications? See, see, this goes to the heart of finance. It goes to the heart of the plumbing. Satoshi Nakamoto's innovation still survives 12 years later in, in this adversarial, adversarial sort of off the grid way. Bitcoin still survives 12 years later. Um, but are there other applications in finance where a shared database system, a shared accounting system is the best way to go? And we've had inventions like this, uh, infrastructure technologies that have radically changed finance. And one of them from several hundred years ago was the joint stock company. When I talk about a technology stack, one from several centuries ago was, can we have a shared ownership of a company. And when that was sort of invented, I guess some people would have said, what do we need that for? This instead of a shared company is a shared database. And, and so that's the debate. Is it really uh, needed? Will it be useful in, in the future? It has led to a crypto market, about $200 billion as of yesterday, two thirds of which is, is Bitcoin. Um, highly volatile, uh, Hassan would say, but what's the intrinsic value? It is a digital scarce store of value, and it only has value because somebody else will move it. When Bitcoin was or rolled out in 2009, nobody saw that it had value. It was just a kind of interesting uh, project. But by 2010, one a uh, person who was in the community said, let's see if I could get anybody to give me something uh, commercially. And it was actually pizza. It wasn't Pizza Net, the Sandra Bullock uh, uh, movie we started with in 1995. But 15 years later in 2010, a, a crypto enthusiast in Florida uh, put out on an email list, I will give you 10,000 Bitcoin if you send me two pizzas. Two pizzas, 10,000 Bitcoin in May of 2010. It took about a week before anybody responded, but two pizzas showed up at his door. And sure enough, uh, 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 this, this uh, crypto enthusiast in Florida sent the 10,000 Bitcoin. Now, at the time, there wasn't a crypto market. At the time, it was thought that the two pizzas were worth about $42 that he had paid uh, 10,000 Bitcoin for. 
that 10,000 Bitcoin today would be valued about $65 million. So 10 years later, you kind of go, wow, that was, that was kind of an interesting time to do that. Um, it's led to different sectors. There's thousands of these coins. The payment or store value tokens are the dominant, about three quarters of the market. Uh, some of you may have heard of Ethereum, but platform tokens where Vitalik Buterin uh, rolled out this thing called Ethereum, and Ethereum is a con conceptually a worldwide shared computer. Uh, it has many attributes of 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 a operating system. I wouldn't compare it and contrast it with iOS and Android, but it does have attributes similar to a worldwide platform layer operating system upon which distributed applications or dApps can be put on top. So this is this ecosystem. There's a few dozen payment or store value tokens. There's dozens of platform tokens. There's 1,000 to 2,000 applications placed on top. The conceptual framework in these applications is they're decentralized. Will anybody use them? Different questions um, along the way. So what has this led to? It's led to blockchain use cases around speculative investing, crowdfunding through initial coin offerings from 2017 to 2019, nearly $30 billion was raised by basically selling a token before you had a business. You might have a good idea, you might have be legitimate players, and you raised money off of this. You weren't selling equity, you were not selling debt, you were selling a token that could be used on some site in the future. Now those tokens have largely been, in 2020 this is, those tokens are largely for crypto exchanges, for gaming, for gambling, for something called decentralized finance and file sharing. Now there's something that's consistent about the first three, crypto exchanges, gaming and gambling. Some of the users of these gaming, gambling and exchange sites want a, a sort of a basis of staying off the grid. They want censorship resistance. See the thing about cryptocurrencies, the good and the bad sometimes is the official sector Though they can track some of it, they can't track all of it. That it's some way sometimes to stay off the grid. I'm not advising this, I'm just saying the economics of it, some of that is about censorship resistant. All of the other uses has been around blockchain technology. And the uses really are potential uses. They haven't taken off. Can we use it in payment systems? Can we use it in trade finance? Can we use it in clearing, settling, and processing? And there are hundreds of projects that have been in proof of concept or pilot stages. None that have truly broken out yet. And this is why I say it hasn't come into the technology stack. You can, by the way, get your MIT diploma on a blockchain technology. Uh, I'm saying that if you do, you can decide um, uh, also to get it in paper form. I thought, uh, Romain, actually, we had a poll to just to see how many people, there's a poll on use of uh, cryptocurrency or something, uh, the first of those two polls. Um, if, if folks don't mind just giving a little uh, flavor for have you ever owned crypto and so forth. So um, it looks like a third have owned Bitcoin or Ethereum or altcoins. And we have, does Bitcoin exhibit the three roles of money? Uh, a little over half, yes, and a little less than half, no. Uh, I'm gonna ask if somebody, one person on the yes side, one person on the no side just wants to articulate why it does not uh, exhibit the three roles of money, the store of value, medium of exchange, unit of account, um, and one, and for this, Romain will cold call. So uh, if somebody wants to take the lead on either side. Any volunteers? Camilo. And, and if you could declare which side you're on so somebody can volunteer on the other side as well. 
Yeah, I I am on the no side. I mean, I, I All right, so just I, for a moment, so somebody on the optimist positive side, please volunteer, but Camilla. Yeah, no, I mean, I I think that still as a medium of exchange, uh Bitcoin and, and the rest of the cryptocurrencies are really limited. If I want to go to, I don't know, to Publix and buy something uh, with Bitcoin, it would be so hard. I'll have to find an app that translates my Bitcoin to real money and then try to pay. And there is also a questionable thing about uh, the store of value. You know, uh, Bitcoin, at least, and Ethereum, I think it's also true, has been fluctuating so much that uh, you, you never know how much value are you getting <laughs> for a Bitcoin day to day. So I think there is still a long way before like fulfilling the, the essentials of, of money. All right. So I think Camilo is saying, I can't go to Publix, not a medium of exchange where I want to go. And it's kind of this volatile uh, store of value. Yeah, and you didn't address a unit of account. But Let's see if there's somebody on the other side who just wants to kind of articulate the other side of this. We have Devin. Devin, please. Oof. I can give the counter, at least in my opinion. Um, I don't think that the idea of a store of value in the medium exchange are shortcomings of the currency. I think they're shortcomings of the market in which it operates. Um, so you can use it to exchange value. If the infrastructure isn't there, that's not the currency's fault. That's sort of the market participants and then with the store of value it does store a value and that value does fluctuate that's true but again i think that's because of the market it's in and speculation going on around these currencies uh camillo do you want to uh, you know you both are unmuted you, you can cross uh, and devin can stay unmuted too is any reply just uh, for 30 seconds no, no, no. I, I just want to say that although it's true that the value of the Bitcoin, it fluctuates with the market. The point is that if you want a worldwide accepted uh, medium of exchange, it cannot fluctuate as much as, as Bitcoin. Otherwise, the financial system and even, you know, people who, who have savings wouldn't uh, have their savings in Bitcoin. I mean, you are not going to put your funding, you know, your, your savings account into Bitcoin because you might get lost overnight. So. And Devin? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I agree um, that it does fluctuate overnight. I wouldn't put my savings in it. I never have. I never will. Um, but I do think it kind of comes down to what is the exact definition of the question you're trying to answer. Like, can you store value in it? Yes. Is the value going to be the same tomorrow? Maybe not. Um, and that's something that might stabilize over time as, like, if it gets used more for day-to-day -day interactions, like going to the shop and it's not, kind of speculation and sort of hype around it, then maybe we can kind of converge to a point where it does satisfy everything fully. Yeah, and in this debate that Devin and Camilla are helping frame is a debate that's a worthy debate. I, I will tell you that I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist, but I actually, I'm probably a little closer to Devin than Camilla on this in terms of it is a digital scarce store of value. Will it be worth something 10 years from now? Maybe not, maybe not. But it has survived kind of in this swamp, this, this uncertain sort of world for 12 years. And uh, uh, it, it has some value to some folks. Hassan earlier would say, but it doesn't have intrinsic value. And I would say, well, it's just a symbol uh, in any regard. It can be a medium of exchange in, in certain places, but it needs an infrastructure. Camillo is absolutely right. Um, the state treasurer of Ohio in late 2018 had announced uh, a straight a state controller, I think it might've been in Ohio, an elected office, that the state of Ohio would accept Bitcoin for taxes. Was it just uh, for political reasons that this gentleman announced it, uh, that he thought it was associating himself with a new innovation in the, in the economy? but they needed an infrastructure to accept the Bitcoin. They had to convert it for a 1% fee uh, to, to US dollars, uh, for sure. It's not much of a unit of account, but sometimes it becomes a unit of account inside of these other decentralized apps inside the ICO space. So it sort of probably exhibits one out of the three mostly. It's a speculative store of value. It can be a medium of exchange. It can be a unit of account, but it hasn't 
adopted this. A number of years ago, the Financial Stability um, uh, Board, um, <clears throat> a worldwide organization of 20, the G20 finance ministers and central bankers, uh, decided that they would no longer call Bitcoin and others cryptocurrencies, and they call them crypto assets. So they were associating more with Camillo's side. They were saying, we're not going to give this the kind of word to call it a currency. And yet the U.S. Department of Treasury, some seven years ago, had to address itself to the question of whether Bitcoin and other similar digital assets were currency under U.S. Bank Secrecy Act laws against uh, money laundering and the like. And for that purpose, they said that Bitcoin was a virtual currency. So there's the U.S. Department of Treasury fitting it into a box. Now, I dare say they needed to somehow address this public policy issue as to whether it was going to be regulated under the Bank Secrecy Act. So somehow they had to call it a currency, call it a virtual currency. Another part of the U.S. Department of Treasury about the same time said it was going to be treated as property for tax purposes. So inside the, the U.S. Treasury Department, uh, clearly for purposes of trying to decide how it was going to be taxed, how it was going to be treated for uh, anti-money laundering laws, one part of the Treasury called it virtual currency, another part of the Treasury, U.S. Treasury, called it property rather than currency, um, and that fit into that. So I think I'll move on a little bit, but um, we can uh, take down the poll, I think, or do I do, do, I do that? You, uh, so if every, every person should be able to close that little polling window. I do not have control over it. Oh, okay. Um, then I need to do that here for a second so that it closes. Okay. So there's a lot of challenges of this shared accounting system, scalability, performance, you can move about seven or 10 transactions on Bitcoin per second. You can move 10 to 20 transactions a second on uh, Ethereum. That's kind of not the shock that we need to the system. Our shared centralized equity clearing system here in the US, the Depository Trust DTCC, needs to move, the Securities and Exchange Commission sort of say, you need to be able to move about 100 million transactions a day. Well, guess what? In the middle of the most volatile time in February, DTCC was moving 350 million transactions. And when I say transactions, it could be for 100 shares, it could be 1,000 shares. The volumes in shares was higher, but I'm talking about how many transactions were moving through that system. Blockchain technology, by and large, has a bunch of issues still to sort through, is the point. From public policy issues, commercial use cases, and the like. Now the question is for the 2020s, as the scalability, performance, and efficiency issues, as privacy and security, as some of these are worked through, is a shared accounting system, a shared ledger system, something that's gonna take off? And I go back, to economic work from the 1930s by Coase. And I just sort of capture it in a little slide here, the trade-offs of centralization and decentralization. And these is a cost curve, but centralization does lead to cost, about a single point of failure, about economic rents, and about uh, capture. You know, we all know that we pay more for something that's highly centralized. If you want to build an app on top of iOS or on top of Apple's iOS or an app on top of Google's Android, you're going to pay a fee because they're the two dominant pipes. If you need to deal with certain centralized financial systems, there's more economic rents. And in fact, financial sector in the U.S. takes about 7.5% of our economy. That's double what it took in the 1960s. Now, it's a bigger economy. It's a bigger financial sector. But does it necessarily need to take 7.5% of our economy? So some would say, all right, those are some of the costs of centralization. And then there's also cost of decentralization coordination, governance, security, scalability. Now, Coase was writing in the 1930s, why do you bring together certain attributes inside of a firm? It was about the theory of the firm and why some things 
or inside a firm, and it was the cost, the cost of information, the cost of coordination, that you bring some things inside, some things are left out. The question is, is will this change this balance somehow? Vitalik Buterin talked about a trilemma and said it's hard to get all three of these, to get security, decentralization, and scalability. So Buterin is the innovator at 19 of the Ethereum network. He's now 25, maybe. But Vitalik Buterin said, look, you can get decentralization like in Bitcoin and security. It's reasonably secure, but it's not scalable. You maybe can get towards scalability, but you're probably going to tend towards more centralization. Now, one of MIT's uh, award-winning computer scientists, Silvio McCalley, says, no, he disagreed. He says, you can actually solve for this. Uh, Silvio uh, won the Turing Award. He's uh, sort of the father, uh, considered the father of something called zero knowledge proofs and said, no, you can solve for this. And Silvio actually took a leave, a sabbatical and leave to create a cryptocurrency and a company around Algorand. And I'm not, I'm not sort of marketing for him, but I'm just, I'm just commenting, there's this debate. Can you solve basically what Satoshi Nakamoto wanted, decentralization in a scalable way and have it be secure? So how does one assess use cases? Because this class is ultimately about sort of sorting through this. Well, first ask the question, is the project project that actually uses cryptocurrency or it services it. And I give examples of companies uh, that are in custody and software and exchange operation. Binance is a big crypto exchange. Coinbase is both an exchange and custody. Fidelity, one of the world's largest asset managers, said, we'll take custody and hold your cryptocurrencies. So you could be on one side of the divide and say, we're going we're to be even like a hardware company. Bitmain and create the hardware in this space. Those are kind of uh, used classic uh, uh, strategy analysis to think about those. The sort of rougher side of this is how do you consider what are the strategic questions about actually using blockchain technology? What are the value creation propositions? And I think it's embedded in this, is it, is it worthwhile to have decentralized computing versus centralized computing? Is there, is there an area that you think has such high economic rents that a decentralized competitor can come in? You could create the case that if Uber and Lyft didn't exist today, that Uber and Lyft, you could say, could be created on a decentralized ledger system that nobody truly had control of the ledger system and all the ride uh, sharing could be with drivers and users using that decentralized app. But then again, who would have actually, who would have actually gone into city after city, airport after airport, and, and sort of done what Uber and Lyft and others have done to get into the system? So I think the basic value question is, centralization versus decentralization and secondly are you filling a gap in the fiat currency system fiat currencies work pretty well now we're going to talk in the next class about the pain points and there are a lot of pain points in the payment system uh, that take considerable uh, uh, challenges and costs to uh, overcome Clearly, strategically, what are the competitors doing? Traditional competitors, those using blockchain. Why use append-only logs, this, this invention of this ledger system? Why have multiple party consensus? Multiple party consensus is a cost. So if you're gonna use it for trade finance, you're gonna try to solve something in trade finance, for instance, what is it solving? What are the costs? It can lower verification and networking costs. That's the core of its economics, but it comes with some costs. Um, there are also a series of technical considerations, literally what data is gonna be put in, who is the multiple share, uh, stakeholders, what are the trade-offs? And I think what we found by and large is there are not that many projects that have taken off. Um, I have here a little bit deeper dive. If you get so close to a project that you think, all right, now let's think about it, I come back to this question about multiple party shared ledgers. 
in Bitcoin, the multiple party shared ledger has worked in part because there was a desire to have a censorship resistant token, a token that could be global, truly move around the globe at times away from what the official sector might ban, away from certain money laundering, any uh, terrorism laws. Uh, that's part of it, but also that it was at least initially hard to track and trace. It's actually gotten easier to track and trace over time. But, but really the question is, if you're gonna think about using blockchain technology, what verification costs are you really lowering and why have this multiple party distributed ledger? A little bit like a shared stock company still has a lot of centralization. You have thousands of people that control a shared stock company, this invention of several centuries ago, but you still have the management team that controls it. How do you deal with that here? So what have we found? We found that the incumbents, big finance by and large, have stayed over to the left-hand side of this screen. They've stayed towards traditional databases. They haven't gone to the cryptocurrency sort of side of the screen, permissionless open protocols. They're exploring a little bit the middle, what's called private blockchain. Private blockchain saying 20 or 50 companies get together. Maybe like in Australia, there is much fanfare in 2016, into uh, actually 2017, there was much fanfare that the Australian Stock Exchange would use a permissioned blockchain technology to update their central clearing. Now, many people would tell you by 2020 that what the Australians have done was inspired by blockchain technology, but it no longer looks like blockchain technology. It's a decentralized distributed database, but what the Australian regulators said is, we need somebody to control this. We need a central controller. The complete opposite of what Satoshi Nakamoto was talking about. Nakamoto was saying no central authority. Uh, the Australians said, well, this is the central clearing, the, the, the sort of the plumbing, the central plumbing of the Australian stock market. No, no, we need somebody who has kind of the overall, uh, plays the overall referee role, so to speak. Um, so, Incumbents by and large are using traditional databases. They're exploring some of these permission databases. They're not really off to the side. Um, Romain, any questions? None so far. We have 12 minutes left. All right. So uh, let me just say something about central bank initiatives. Uh, central banks, and we'll chat about this a little bit more when we do payments. Central banks have taken note of this and they've thought both can I use the blockchain technology for our payment systems? Because central banks in most countries control those payment systems. Or can we actually create a digital currency? At first, I mean, Bitcoin was not really on the radar of central bankers. By 2018, it became on the radar because the market had taken off and it was for a brief moment worth almost a trillion dollars. It's back down to 200 billion now, but it, they took note. And in some countries like Sweden, they really said, maybe we should be doing something here. We should be creating a crypto equivalent, a digital currency. And one of the readings was a Bank of International Settlement reading, which showed three different ways that a central bank could do a digital currency. And this is just for your reference to remind you that there, it was in the reading. Um, but going back to these projects a little bit, some of the projects are just papers. Ecuador tried to do a project actually, a dollar denominated cryptocurrency, and it failed because nobody in Ecuador wanted to use it. Ecuador was already dollarized. But the one to watch most closely, China, which might be a hybrid, and I'll go back to the chart in a second, China has announced they're doing a digital currency electronic payment. It will be fully backed by the central bank. It will be fully a RMB or digital Hawaii. And in a sense, it may be as much a reaction to Bitcoin 
as it's a reaction to Alipay and WeChat Pay being dominant in the retail payment system in China. And it's also a reaction to Facebook that was starting something called the Libra Project. So this, again, is a central tenant where I am, where I think of this is that the central banks are reacting in part because big tech has been reacting and, and startups are there. And they're saying, maybe we can do something better. Um, the opportunities that they see, the opportunities is that they say, well, maybe we can stay in the means of payment, we can promote greater competition, and we can address some pain points. But on the other side, the other side, they're really worried. They're deeply worried that if they offer the public a digital representation of central bank money, that they might disintermediate the commercial banks. The central strategic question for central banks is, can we offer the public a digital representation of that which is paper? So I've covered central bank digital currencies uh, too quickly. I'm gonna come back to it when we talk about payment systems as well. But Romain, we only have a few minutes, so I'm gonna take uh, questions. Yeah, we have a question from Victor. Hi, Professor. Um... I wanted to come back to the previous point about handling databases through a private blockchain network because I didn't fully understand how does it work. Could you give me some more guidance on it? So um, Satoshi Nakamoto's concept is that you could have hundreds or thousands of folks, computers, sharing a database and it's an open database. And that that database can secure the ledger through this concept of a log structure, block of data, block of data, block of data with cryptography. The, the commercial banks and the financial firms said, we, we're, not, we're not comfortable of having hundreds or thousands of people share a database. In fact, we can't under various guidelines of privacy, uh, uh, of, of data protection, we can't have hundreds of people share that database. But they're, they're they're looking at maybe we can have a shared form of cooperation or what somebody might call coopetition. We'll cooperate around a trade finance platform and then we'll compete on top of it for the provision of, of lines of credit and, 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 and uh, trade financing and so forth. So they've come together and they said maybe we can have a shared closed system amongst 20 banks, 16 banks, 30 banks and the like. And so there's five or six big consortiums trying to put together a trade finance private shared ledger. Now, once you have that, once you say it's only these 18 firms will share it, this form of cooperating on a shared database but competing on top of it, that form of coopetition you don't necessarily need a token. So there's no cryptocurrency. It's just a shared blockchain technology database. Some call it a digital uh, ledger technology, DLT, to contrast it with cryptocurrencies. I'm a little bit looser in the vocabulary, admittedly. But that's how it, that's the conceptual framework for it, if that helps. Yeah, thank you. Let me just say a couple ground truths in close. Um, I really do think, and, and I don't know which side to end up on, Devin or Camilla's side in terms of, of, is it money? But I think Nakamoto solved the payment riddle, avoiding double spending. It's lasted 12 years. Whether you like it, whether you love it, hate it. Two is, I'm sorry, Hassan, I'm kind of money's but a social and economic construct. I'm, I'm deeply with Plato on that one. Uh, but I respect those that believe otherwise. I mean, there's a good debate that's gone on a couple thousand years. We already live in an age of digital money. And in fact, the corona crisis will accelerate that. Um, we, we will still have physical paper money, but we'll use it less and less in a transaction. And, and physical paper money is more and more just a store of value, that we're not using physical paper money much as a medium of exchange right now. 
append only logs and multi party consensus actually does provide an alternative, but it doesn't mean it's everybody's alternative. It can address verification costs, but it doesn't make sense to adopt it unless there's really some viability and a value proposition of that shared ledger system. We didn't talk much about it, but I will say one ground truth is, is that the crypto markets, that $200 billion market, it's ripe with scams and frauds. It just is. Um, and so what's happened by 2020 is cryptocurrencies have evolved to be a speculative asset class, generally not that correlated with equities and bonds. And I'll give you one statistic, the worldwide stock of gold, that gold that could be in four Olympic sized pools, collectively is worth nine or $10 trillion, roughly, collectively. So some people would say a speculative store of value that's only worth 2% of that, 200 billion, might be worthwhile in, in a big portfolio of a family office or a, or a hedge fund. Um, the ICO boom and bust raised about 30 billion. Not much is being raised there now, but it's worthwhile to take note of. Most of this is lightly regulated, and so retail investors are not getting much protection. I, I think that's unfortunate. But I still come back to the last point. I think it's been a catalyst for change. I think it might be one of these technologies we look back in decades and say it was a remarkable catalyst for change for central bankers. And to think through whether it's trade finance or other areas in finance, was there a way to form some cooperation and compete on top of it, some coopetition? But just like we didn't know that the internet and geolocation devices would lead to disruption in rides. And we, you know, Uber and Lyft, we couldn't predict in, in the 1990s that the taxi business in New York was gonna be completely disrupted. We don't know what blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies will disrupt later in the 2020s or in the 2030s. So, so that's kind of my wrap on it. Uh, you can sort of, get a sense of, of why I'm not going to say I'm a maximalist in this area. Uh, but I'm also not all the way a minimalist. The minimalist would say, no, none of these ground truths matter. I think it's a really important technology, if nothing else, because it's been a remarkable catalyst for change on how central banks and others think about payment systems, which we'll take up in our next class.